number of different pieces of your programs. Um, so please feel free to check out the hub for some pretty terrific resources in there. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Dave um, to walk us through our revised faculty workshop. Thanks, Dave. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Good. Let's see. I guess it's afternoon everywhere here in the country. So good afternoon. Um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. I know that this is a, a stressful time a few weeks before. Well, it, you, you may have started your semester already or you may be like us a few weeks, a few weeks away. But regardless, it's a little chaotic and a little stressful and appreciate you taking the time with, uh, to spend with us here today. Um, so what I'm going to do here today is um, uh, walk through the slide deck as again as if as if you're as if you're faculty and, and give the workshop um, as if this is a you know a faculty workshop um, and um, so I'll be kind of in character as a workshop presenter and uh, yeah feel free to ask questions in the chat um, before I begin I want to thank Tanya Gross Tanya is our director of educational programs. Uh, for the OEN and uh, Tanya's here. Tanya, can you wave? There she is. And uh, thank you. And uh, I just want to thank her for, for taking care of this workshop and taking care of the resources around it and improving it, um, basically caring for it. Um, it was getting to a point where I didn't have time to keep it updated and uh, we were really stretched and she has really taken it and, and moved it forward. And um, I also want to thank the OEM presenters who they've given us lots of suggestions for good ideas of how to improve the workshop. That's happened for years. And so, um, you know, this is really a community resource that's been developed, you know, by the community and with the community. So thank you to those presenters as well. And as Sarah said, these slides are openly licensed, available on, uh, on the hub. Um, and Last of all, I guess I want to thank all of you who have taken this workshop and made it your own and uh, to meet local needs and to um, offer it at your institution or in your state or wherever. Last time I looked, I believe this workshop had been given over 650 times uh, as part of some local educational program um, and mostly to, to to, by people like you, by, by local librarians or staff or faculty. So um, those workshops have led to thousands of faculty adoptions as part of your you know, local open education program. So, um, so thank you, that's what it's for. It was, it's, it's, it was created to make a difference and you're making a difference with it. So, so here we go. Um, I also wanna say, I, it's in the 90s here today. I have my air conditioning on. I hope it's not too distracting. I'm on the top floor of our house. Um, in an hour and a half, if I turned it off, you would see sweat dripping down my face by the end of the workshop. So I'm gonna leave it on if that's okay. All right, so welcome to the uh, Open Education Network's um, workshop on access, affordability, and, ac and academic success. Um, this workshop, um, here's the agenda of what we're going to cover today. First, I want to talk about, you know, we're talking about open education today. Um, and I, but I don't want to just jump right into, you know, what is open education. I want to first start with defining the problem that we're trying to solve or problems that we're trying to solve. I also want to make note of um, the fact that many of these problems have been um, exacerbated during the COVID-19 situation. Um, six months ago, seven, eight months ago, this workshop would have stood on its own with the challenges that we're going to talk about. But today, the challenges are just so much more for our students. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we move forward. Then we'll get into defining what open education is and what open textbooks are. And then um, hopefully answer some common questions you might have around them. And then also talk about, you know, okay, now what can we do? What actions, actions can we take to, to move forward? Um, open textbooks aren't the reason here. They're not the reason for this workshop. They're not the purpose of it, even though we're gonna spend most of it talking about open textbooks. 
the purpose of this workshop is really this. This is from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it's about um, stating that you know higher education should be equally accessible to all. Um, that's um, that's I think not only what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, but to be honest, that's why all of us get up every morning and go to work, right? I mean, this is what our institutions say. If you look at your mission statement of your institution, it says something very similar, like our goal is to educate everyone, right? And here's the University of Minnesota's mission. It says that they believe that all people are enriched by understanding all people. So that's what this is about. This is about including as many people as possible in this educational endeavor that we take up every day, um, not leaving people out. Um, and then you'll, you'll see where the open education piece comes in. But as I said before, um, this is even worse today. I mean, the kind of inequities that exists in, um, in higher education. We can say these things. We can say that we believe these things. But to be honest, uh, there are a lot of divides in our country. There are a lot of uh, challenges. Um, here's one example that's especially uh, prominent today with the COVID-19. Online access is critical, right? And um, uh, we, we, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing here today. We wouldn't be able to do what you're doing in higher education with your virtual education or in K-12 what they're doing. Uh, without this infrastructure and technology access to it, but not everyone has access to it, or at least not everyone has equal access to it. Right. But another one that's persistent, that um, COVID or no COVID, um, is is the financial inequities in our in our higher ed system. Um, I want to just draw your attention to this chart, which is showing funding in the U.S. and for public institutions. There are two main sources of funding. There's state funding, right? State uh, state funded public education, public funding, and there's tuition funding, the, the money that the students pay. And nationally, you can see, you know, back in the early '90s, what the uh, the difference was. It was it was at probably a two to one uh, or more ratio of uh, the state funding, the state paying that much more than what the student is paying. But that's really kind of evened out over the years. The, um, the amount of money that students pay has um, nationally pretty much doubled. The amount that state has paid has stayed pretty consistent. So the load is increasingly being put on the student. Here's what that same graph looks like in Minnesota. This is just Minnesota. So in 2010, 20, 2009, those lines actually crossed. So our students are actually paying the majority of the cost of higher education. Right? So I would say that what the, what happens then is that the the um, the burden on students is different than it's ever been before. It's really so much higher than it's ever been before. The financial burden, and you can say, well, you know, they should just. Um, Get a job and work more, or um, you know, there are a number of solutions to this, right? You can you can work. You can if you need money. If you need more money, you can work and you can take out more loans. Um, but in many ways, this is really challenging. You can see this chart saying that how many hours, um, how many hours of uh, of work per week a student would need to pay um, to work their way through college to pay for their uh, um, the cost of higher education. We really don't want our students to be full-time employees as well. We want them to be full-time students, right? If we want them to be successful, but the stress is really on, is really on the, um, if, if they need the funding, they need to work. Right? This is especially hard during the COVID times here. There are fewer jobs, fewer student jobs, um, I know at Minnesota, there are a lot of student jobs that they've decided they, they don't want students on campus for, right? They're trying to keep people off campus. So there are less opportunities, fewer opportunities for students to actually um, work. Excuse me, there we go. 
And then when it comes to, again, the other opportunity here for students to bring in more funding and for their higher education, it comes, it's, it's, it's debt, right? It's taking out more loans. This is where the majority of students get their funding from. Um, this graph shows the yellow line here is uh, credit card debt. The purple line there is student loan debt. And you can see that uh, again, around 2010, 2011, those lines actually crossed. So nationally, there is much, much more student debt out there than there is credit card debt. You can see that in 2008, 2009, there was the, you know, the, an impact on credit card debt when the markets crashed and we had the recession and everything. Student debt just continues to climb year after year after year. Um, so they're borrowing more and more, working more and more. And what we're finding is an increase in, the, in, the, in a, a, a deficit in meeting their student needs, meeting their basic student needs of uh, having a place to live and eating. Okay. This is a national organization of obviously college and university food banks. In 2012, when this organization was created, there were 13 members of this organization, 13 institutions. As of this year, there are over 700, 700 institutions that are a member of this organization. That, so in other words, that have food banks now on their campus. It's become more of the norm than not. That was not the case even just a few years ago. Again, an example, here's the University of Minnesota, we have a food bank. Um, in fact, uh, we had our university leadership just put out a call last week for donations to it. One of the reasons is that uh, food banks in this time of COVID are, see, are being stressed. They're seeing volunteers disappear again because they need to be in person. People don't want to take the risk. Um, and they see their supplies drying up as, as food supplies are a little lighter than they were previously. So challenging times. So what can we do about this? What, what, you know, how can we reduce the cost? Obviously students are, you know, doing everything they can to bring in the revenue that they need to pay for the cost, but how, what can we do about the costs? The federal government asked institutions to, um, to estimate their cost of attendance. And these are the categories that they ask institutions to, to estimate. Tuition fees, room and board, books and supplies, personal expenses, and transportation. Now, you can guess which one of these we're gonna talk about today, right? We're gonna talk, talk about this one. But I do wanna just stop for a second and recognize the fact that books and supplies is not the, the biggest cost here. Right, it's not by far the lot probably depending on the institution, but it's probably not even close to the highest ones, which are probably tuition and fees and maybe room and board. Of course, that depends on whether the student is living at home or not. But so why are we talking about books and supplies? Why aren't we talking about the big ones? Sometimes forget that in a, a, a environment like this, no one's going to answer me. So I'll answer it. So the answer is basically that we don't have control over any of these things. If, as faculty, if you look at this list, there's only one of them that we have any kind of control over. Right? There. Yes. Thank you, Katie. Yep. So we, we have some, as faculty, have control over books and supplies. Right? Um, there's another reason that we focus on this one, and and it's it's um, because it not, it's not the largest one, as I said, it's not the biggest one, but it does have a disproportionate impact on student success for, for its size. The impact on student success is disproportionate for a number of reasons. Oftentimes the cost is a, is a bit of a surprise to students, right? Um, it's, it's also oftentimes a cost that's outside of the normal billing cycle and billing processes of an institution. And so students are left kind of their, to their own devices to find the books. Um, and all oftentimes, well, we'll get, in, we'll get into what their behaviors are here in a second. But the cost of textbooks have increased incredibly. And um, 
and there, there are studies out there saying that it's increased higher than any other consumer item, but you know, a thousand percent since the 1970s. It's keeping pace with other things like tuition. It's well over the medical costs um, and as far as that increase goes. And so um, it's just gotten to be such a burden on, um, on students. The um, College Board estimates that students should will should budget between 1240 and 1440 or so um, for books and supplies each year. That's what they tell students they should budget for the year. At the University of Minnesota, we tell our students, all of our incoming students, they should budget $1,000 a year. Um, these are numbers that are required by the federal government, these estimated costs of attendance, right? Um, you can find your own estimated cost of attendance if you just uh, Google the name of your institution and then cost of attendance and you'll, you should find it pretty quickly. They are acquired by the federal government to make it public what these estimates are. So, um, but there are studies, this one done by the National Association of College Bookstores, um, that say that students are actually reporting that they only spend about 400, this is this year's data, $413 per year on books and supplies. That's a pretty big difference, right? Between what they're told to budget and what they're saying they actually are. Here's another question that won't get answered. Why is there a difference? What's the difference? Why would they spend so uh, much less? Thank you, Katie. Yes, they're finding other ways. They're finding other things uh, that they can do with these. Uh, excuse me, other ways to, 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 to get what they need here, including renting, um, including a number of things that we're going we're gonna to look at here. Here are strategies students say that you take. Now, these are above and beyond the things that we might do for them. Let's, like, let's say your library has a textbook reserve program, right? I'm not talking about this. This isn't, we do that for them. Some institutions do that. Well, bookstores will have rental programs or use textbook programs or so on, right? All these different programs that we do. Yes, we do. That's great. Anything we can do to make it more affordable, awesome. These, these are still the behaviors, the things that students do to to try to deal with that cost, right? So they purchase older editions, they delay buying, they don't buy it at all, they share the textbook with other students, or they maybe download the textbook from the internet, which uh, is code for, you know, potential copyright violation. And, you know, I've, I've separated that one out a little bit from the other four because it is a potential legal issue right a, a risk for students a legal risk if they're downloading pdf versions of books that someone has scanned um, the other four aren't legal risks they're not legal risks, but they're still risks and students understand that when they do it uh, they just know that they have to still do it they are still taking a risk not a legal risk they're taking an academic risk right so um, I, uh, for instance, I want to talk about delaying purchasing a textbook. Um, there are a number of reasons, just as an example, there are a number of reasons that they might delay. Um, one of them might be the, the, the GI plan. Maybe they're on the GI plan. Um, that uh, is something that uh, takes a lot of paperwork and time, and oftentimes they don't get the funding until well into the term. And when that's the case, they may then go weeks without the textbook at all. If they have financial aid, the same situation. Oftentimes financial aid doesn't come in until after the drop deadline, meaning that they can't afford the textbook before that drop deadline, which means they go weeks into the semester without one. Um, I oftentimes tell the story, story of, excuse me, of our three boys, we, my wife and I have three Three boys are all out of college now, thankfully. Um, but there was a point, there was a point at which they were all in college at the same time, all three of them. One was a freshman, one was a sophomore, and one was a senior. Um, 
a little challenging financially uh, that year, especially. Um, but um, so, you know, we had to sit them down when they entered college and we, we sat them down and said to them, you know, you need to, you need to live like students, right? We're going to help you out with this, but you need to do everything you can. And, and we told them to live like students. Um, so what does live like students mean? Um, live like students, generally, the number one answer I get when I ask that question is ramen. Um, but it also means, you just basically means you don't buy anything that's, that's not absolutely essential, right? So um, they did, um, they did a great job of that and, and they really um, uh, did a nice job of making it as affordable as we could, as they could. Um, but you know, at the beginning of the semester, I would, if I sit down with one of them and ask them, so did you buy your textbooks yet? They would generally say um, pretty much the same answer every time, which is, um, well, not yet. I'm gonna wait as long as I can to see if I really need them. And I think that's actually the answer that's become the default for many students. They're gonna wait as long as possible, see if they really need the books, even if their instructor says they're required. Right? Um, and in some ways I have to say, I kind of appreciated that silently. I won't tell them that, but I appreciated the fact that um, they're, they are doing exactly what we asked them to do. Don't buy anything that isn't essential. So. I'm not saying textbooks aren't essential, but they are making the judgments. They are making a judgment of whether it's essential or not. That's what we ask them to do, make judgments about what you're spending money on. Research shows that freshmen tend to purchase required textbooks at a much higher rate than sophomores, and then they more than juniors, and them more than seniors. And I think we all know why that is. I think um, in any given term, you'll hear from pretty much every student some frustration that, oh, I bought this $200 textbook and they only use chapter one, or they didn't use it at all, or um, I found out I couldn't return it and get, a, you get paid for, you know, the used, uh, in the used textbook market or whatever. And so those are all value judgments. And those are the kinds of things I asked, we asked our sons to do and we, um, when we sat them down of course, we would tell our sons to, you know, go buy these books, you need them. But again, it's, this is a situation students are in. They're having to make judgments about value. And sometimes textbooks because of the high cost. And sometimes because of how instructors might use them, they learn to make these value judgments. Okay. So here's what students report. This is the same survey from the National Association of College Stores. Uh, where they talk about what are the biggest cost challenges. In other words, what are you, what are you most stressed about cost-wise? And of course, tuition is going to be at the top, right? It is by far the highest cost at most places. But right behind it, ahead of housing, food, and living expenses, and everything else, is course materials. Right? So that should tell you how much stress they're dealing with and, and why they might be trying to use some of these strategies to cope with it. So finally here in kind of defining the problem that we're trying to deal with, um, I want you to hear this story of this young man who um, tells you a little bit about his experience buying textbooks um, and listen for some of the strategies he uses and then the impacts that those strategies have had. There's a student at Carlson, uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people to take the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans for my brothers uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition and um, so I, I have two of the required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between <laughs> two of my roommates and a guy down the hall. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, and the other two, I just, I don't really worry about because I mean, I don't have enough money for that right now, to be honest, but it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. <laughs> um, but I'd say for 
I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now. I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to um, twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done. And then I can read the book and then either like get shorted on sleep or something. Like sometimes I've had to stay up as late as three, four, five a.m. and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up and go to class because I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. A lot of the times it's just you got shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you wanted because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult. I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking, because if they ever share a textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing, because it's, if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it fulfills a requirement or like if I might have to take that because that's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, I'm so kind of shocked because I, I'm completely broke from buying textbooks last year. So I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy. And it's just kind of, it always, it always the second tuition, I call it, always kind of uh, surprises me. Just this past year, I, I've probably spent in the ballpark of $1,000 and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been difficult. So what you heard from him, a um, couple different strategies, right? You heard that he didn't buy some textbooks. You heard that he shared some textbooks. And um, um, that's a, a strategy that it, at first sounds like, oh, that's, at least they all have access to the textbooks, but you can you hear the impact it's had on him and the stress that it creates for him. Um, not having the textbook when he wants and having to wait all night till someone else is done with it. And you can imagine what the demand is for that textbook uh, right before a test or an assignment is due or something like that. So, um, and, and that's gonna be, almost impossible in the COVID times here, isn't it? Sharing a textbook. It's gonna be nearly impossible because you can't get together very easily to kind of share them. You can't sit down together as easily and kind of use it all at once. Um, so um, a little bit about this young man, like he, he had a he had full-time job he had maxed out his loans, uh, which is why you heard him hear, you heard him talk about his, this alternative loan. I think he called it an alternative loan from his brother. So he, he, he borrowed money from his brothers, mainly for his textbooks. Um, he actually was also volunteering, or not volunteering, getting paid as a medical research subject. So, I mean, I don't know what else we could ask this what young man to do, and he still was have a, having a hard time affording um, affording his textbooks and school generally. So, um, happy news! This video was created um, what maybe five or six years ago. Um, he has since graduated. I always kind of wondered. Uh, Tanya checked on him, and he uh, he graduated with a lot of debt. Uh, but he graduated and works at a works at a at 3M here in town. So, um, but you can see just even in this short video clip how much stress this brings to his life, right? brought to his life. Probably still does, as he's still paying for it. Probably. So this is the impact of that stress and those strategies that students take. This is if you don't remember anything else from this workshop, like this about the problem we're trying to address. This is a, a good summary right here. This is a study done in, by the state of Florida, by the Florida Virtual Library. Um, they, uh, did, they've done this study three times and you can see um, that it hasn't changed much over time. Um, this is the impact students say the cost of textbook has had on their academic success. Um, again, you can imagine that 
in times of COVID when some of the strategies they've been using might not work the way, like sharing a textbook, for instance. Uh, buying a used print one might be harder to find when you're all virtual. Uh, using the library's uh, textbook reserves may be impossible. Um, all of those kinds of things no, long, no longer on the plate. They're no longer tools in the student's tool belt to try to reduce their stress and their costs. So I can imagine that this is uh, these numbers, if they did this study again, uh, would be much higher. Although Katie just let me know that um, before this meeting, before this webinar, that the Florida Virtual Library has been defunded by the uh, state of Florida and will no longer be due to COVID issues and budget issues and won't be doing the survey anymore. So we may never know. So, okay, so I know that's a little stressful. Are you stressed out yet? Um, it's hard to tell from here. Uh, the that's defining the problem. Those are the, that's the main problem, this kind of affordability. But I want you to keep in mind the larger picture, the picture of basically our job in higher education of being inclusive, of making sure as many people as possible can attend and succeed in higher education. And again, we focused a lot on cost. We'll talk a little bit later about some other challenges uh, that we feel can be addressed by open education. So what would be the solution to this? We're just going to talk about solutions from now on, so not so depressing. What would be the solution to this? If you, excuse me, if you wanted this to just be completely solved, you want these percentages to go to zero, like let's just go all the way. Let's not just reduce it, let's solve it. What would do that? Well, I'll tell you, Dave, what would do that? Uh, if there were no costs, right? if textbooks didn't cost anything. Um, and the challenge there, yeah, free textbooks, thanks Mandy. And the challenge there is just simply, it seems unrealistic to think that, um, that the textbooks could be free. We know how much it, it's expensive to create, it takes a lot of effort, probably years of effort by authors, you know, faculty members. So um, it seems unrealistic, so people generally don't go there and say, oh, a solution to this is free textbooks. But um, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of what we call of open textbooks. Okay, now notice I'm not calling them free textbooks, and there's a reason for that. You'll see a little bit later. Um, open textbooks are textbooks that were funded, created, and licensed to be um, freely available, copyable, editable, a lot of things we're going to talk about here in a minute. So they're created intentionally by somebody to help with some of these challenges. Okay, it's intentional. So I want to talk about how they get created. And this is the part that a lot of people get hung up on. Like, how can you possibly end up with something free without being kind of like taking advantage of somebody, right? Um, someone's free labor or something. So before we talk about these open textbooks, let's just talk about our assumptions about how textbooks are created and, and generally how they are, commercial textbooks are created. And this is overly simplified, but here we go. A publisher, a publisher um, publishes a textbook. That textbook um, is sold to students. The money from the sale of that textbook goes back to the publisher. The publisher recuperates its costs. I mean, it could be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, most likely, especially with all the marketing and every, and sales that go on uh, with the publisher. So, right, so um, they need to recuperate their costs. Um, otherwise, they're, they're, they wouldn't make them, right? They also need uh, to pay the author, and they usually pay them um, as um, a percentage, right? They pay a, um, a royalty. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody help me. Royalty, is that right? I haven't given this workshop right. in like Royalties. eight months. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and, and those are really usually single digit royalties that, that um, are, are paid to the author and um, the rest pays for the production and the, and the profit of the publisher. So, so 
this is basically it, right? I mean, this is how we assume textbooks are made, and they are generally commercial textbooks. This is how they're made. If you look at all the players here, if you look at all the players, you can understand the motivation of everybody involved, right? You can understand the publisher and why they might want to do this, right? They're going to make some money, make a profit. Um, the author, sure, right? Same thing there. They, they might have more motivation than just money, and most likely they do. Most likely their motivation is also to contribute to their field, to express their own ideas, to make a, and maybe they have ideas about how students can learn best, right? Um, so, um, so they have a lot of motivators. Students, of course, they are told they need to buy these textbooks. That's their motivation, right? Okay, so makes sense. We can understand how everyone is motivated here. So let's talk about a different model. And this is generally how these open textbooks are created. An open textbook is usually, not always, but usually created at a college or university, at a higher ed institution, and funded by that higher ed institution, right? So they can publish a textbook. The students, of course, um, don't pay for the textbook, so there's no money going back, right? They're, they are created with the intent of being free. So there's no money going back to the institution from the students. There still certainly could be money going to the author. Now, they're not going to be royalties, but they're, because there's no, a royalty is a percentage of a sale, but there could be um, a flat payment for the, for, the, for the work, right? It could be support, it could be money, it could be a lot of things for those faculty who want to publish something and get their name out there and make a difference in their field. And again, be somewhat, at least have some money to connect it to it, right, for their time. I would say for many years, that money that funds all of this has come in from foundations or government grants or from maybe even consortial funding. And we'll look at some of these uh, in a bit, some examples of that. But I would say today that's starting to dry up a little bit. And those funding, that funding is mainly being taken on by as part of the mission of the college and university where they're creating publishing programs. Now, I would say not the, the majority of institutions in this country do not have the, this kind of publishing program, but enough do that it's making a significant difference and it's growing very quickly. So some examples, um, this is a textbook that was made in, uh, I always forget if this is made in Oregon, it's my memory, and it won an award, thank you, and it won an award for, from the Textbook Authors Association for best textbook of the year, right? It's a college, college success book. It's an open textbook. Um, these are textbooks created by um, OpenStax, which is an arm of Rice University. So it's part of Rice University. They were initially funded um, by foundations, by Hewlett Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and a number of other foundations, and have millions of dollars in used to create the original editions of these textbooks. And they've created uh, their goal was to create um, textbooks for the top 25 enrolled courses in the U.S. And they did that. They did that a few years ago. They, they got to that threshold. And now they're continuing to not only improve them, but, but come up with new ones. And they're basically self-funded now by making a dollar or two on print editions, partnerships with technology companies, things like that. So. Um, so this model isn't just a model that could exist, maybe, hopefully, someday. This is a model that exists now and it's being used by higher ed institutions. Whoops, excuse me. Um, I should mention there are also textbooks created by individuals. I, don't, I shouldn't skim over that. There are textbooks created by individuals who make it completely on their own with no support from their institution. Um, and they do it usually because they're frustrated with what's available in their course, um, you know, in their field, and they create something that meets the specific needs of their students. And I, we, there are dozens of those in our open textbook library. Those are there too, okay. But there's one thing that's still um, missing from this model. Um, and it, again, it's a model that it exists now. If you look at the model on the left, um, there's one thing that's missing from that one too, and that's copyright. Copyright's like a critical piece of this model. If copyright didn't exist, 
if copyright didn't exist, that model would break, right? They would publish a textbook and how many of them would they sell? Maybe one, right? And the rest could just be copies, right? That's what copyright does, it protects a publisher, an, a, 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 an intellectual property um, item from being copied, right? So, so it's essential there. And copyright um, ha, is uh, the default. When you create something, if you're taking notes right now or if you're doodling at your desk, those notes or doodles are copyrighted just by the fact that you made them and you put them down in some, some tangible form. You do not have to register them anywhere. It just by default is that way. So the model on the right is the same way. That college and university created a textbook. It is copyrighted by default. That's just the way our intellectual property laws work. So if they sent that book to you and said, hey, we meant for this to be free, and you know what, go ahead and copy it and do whatever you want to do with it. That's what the, uh, that is not legal coverage for you. If you actually send it to your students, make copies and send it off, as an instructor, you are taking a legal risk because it is copyrighted and you are making a copy. So the problem here is that the end user of this textbook doesn't know and isn't, um, it isn't clear to them what the intent is of the original user and they're not protected. If you want to use something that's copyrighted in your course, what do you generally need to do? So let's say it's a book and you want a, a, every student to have a copy of chapter five. Uh, well, let's use a larger thing. So fair use doesn't come to play maybe. But let's say you want a, uh, the whole book. You want students to have access to it. You would need to pay the publisher, right? You need to go to the publisher and say, hey, I want a license for this. And I want, I, want, I want my students to have this. They would say, sure, that'll cost you, you know, $500. And then when you pay the $500, what you get in return is a license, right? That's the solution. Then you have legal coverage that um, you cannot be, um, you, you, you're, you know that you're safe as far as copyright goes. The same thing is true on the, on the thing on the right, the, the model on the right. What you need here, what you need, because copyright exists here too, what you need is a license, something that gives you the protection and the, you can be assured that Yep, I'm good. I'm in good shape here, right? I can send this to my students. I'm covered. So, copyright in this in in with open textbooks, copyright is not sufficient, right? It doesn't quite do the job for this model, and that's why we need the Creative Commons. The Creative Commons is a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization that's sole purpose really is to manage these licenses, to create, create it and manage it, these licenses, which are licenses for people who want to share copyrightable intellectual property. So if you want your book to be free, if you want your book to be able to be shared with all your students, if you want it to, if you want it to be editable, if you want it to be copyable, if you want all those things, if you want them to legally be able to do those things, end users, then all you need to do is put a Creative Commons license on it. What you're doing, you're not giving up your copyright. What you're doing is just you're 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 saying instead of all rights reserved of copyright, you're saying I'm only reserving some of my rights. I'm still the copyright holder, but I'm telling you, the end user, that you know what? Here's some of the things you can do with it. You can cut in here, there. Here are the things you can do. You can copy it. You can share it. You can keep it forever if you want to. You can edit it. You can mix it with other things. You can use it uh, for whatever you want. Um, and so that's what a Creative Commons license allows you to do. So this model needs that one last thing. It needs that little C in the book, the little CC. It needs a Creative Commons license on it. And generally you can find that on the copyright page. You can see that it's, it'll say this book is covered by a Creative Commons license, and then you know that you're okay. You know what you can do with it. You can do these kinds of things with it. So these are what the Creative Commons license look like. 
Um, the creative, there are six flavors of Creative Commons licenses. And those six flavors are really just combinations of these four, these four symbols, these four components. So you can see those four, are, they're just remixed in different ways. I'm going to make myself disappear for a second. Um, so if you understand these four symbols, you'll understand these six licenses, okay, and what they mean. So I'm just really quickly going to go through these. The, the first one, the buy, um, the buy symbol here is uh, the is the attribution. So it basically means, um, you know, you can do any of these things you want to my book, but you need to attribute me. You need to say who it's by, right? So all of these symbols are kind of like caveats. You can do all these things, but here's the catch. Okay, here's the limitations I'm putting on you. So for the by one, the limitation is you need to attribute me appropriately. So everyone knows that I made this book. Don't just copy it, take my name off of it, right? So that protects you as the, um, as the creator to know that you did this good work, right? The second one, NC, means non-commercial. And generally what it means is it's, it's a component for those who want to share things, want to share their intellectual property, but they don't want, they're not comfortable with someone making money from it. For some reason, they just don't feel like that's right. So they can still do these six things, excuse me, they can still do these six things, but um, those, um, but they're putting a little bit of a limitation on the use. They're saying you can't make a profit from this, non-commercial. Okay. The third one is SA means share alike. This is the most confusing one, at least for me. What it means is you can do these things Here's my textbook, you can do these things. The catch is if you edit it or if you mix it with something else, that new thing you make, that derivative work, that new thing you make it has to have the same license that I used generally. So, so for instance, if I use this license right here, the buy essay, if I make a book and I put this license on mine, if you take that textbook and you translate it to Spanish, then um, that new spent, that's a new work. That's a derivative work. That work should have this same license on it. Okay, that's what essay means. And then the last one, ND is the most restrictive of all. The ND license means, the ND component means, you know, here's my book. You can do any of these things you want. But if you edit it, or excuse me, but you cannot edit it and you cannot mix it. You cannot change it at all. Okay, so it's really putting restrictions on you. You can still copy it, you can still share it, keep it forever, use it for pretty much anything you want, but you can't change it. Okay, so that's what those six mean. If you look, pick any random one here, you should be able to tell me what that license means. So if I decide to put by NC on my textbook, that would mean you could take this book and do any of these things that you want to, but you need to attribute me appropriately. That's the buy part. And if you're planning on using it commercially to make a profit, um, then you know that's not cool either. You, if that's if that's what you want to do, you should still reach out to me, and maybe we can make some other arrangement. But you can't use this license to do that. That makes sense. So that's it. Um, if uh, we were in person, I would just quiz you right here and um, see if, whether you knew these licenses or not. That's that's all there is to it. If just understanding those four components, you should be able to understand these licenses. So, some examples of some textbooks that. Um, uh, excuse me. There's some example, an open textbook example here. This is one created by OpenStax at uh, Rice University. And um, just as an example, it, so it has an open license. It has a CC BY license. It has this one in the upper left. So it's the most open, like the least restrictive. We just have to make sure if you use it or you edit it or you do anything to it, that you attribute the owners of it, the creators, which is OpenStax, Rice University, right? 
Um, there are, it's almost a 1300 page book. It's huge. You can get it as a PDF. You can get it as an EPUB. You can get it in print if you want to. The print version of it um, will of course cost money because paper costs money and ink costs money, printing costs money, shipping costs money. So it will cost something, but it tends to be about maybe 20% of what a comparable commercial book might be. Um, but but that's a that's a common misperception is this is just all online that, that people conflate um, um, people will conflate uh, free and online and open right and they are different things uh, an open textbook um, could be online or could be print it just has to be licensed to do those things I showed you earlier right edit it share it copy it all those things it's a little easier to do those things with digital versions but. Um, you can also read this on the web if you want to, and you can also take this in, and 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 um, access it in a service called Bookshare, which Bookshare is a is an online service that takes content and exports it in accessible versions. So it could be in um, a Daisy version, which is what screen reader uh, uh, compatible. It could be a Braille. Uh, a Braille printer version, so on, so that you can take the content and create accessible um, resources um, that you can use. That's something you could not either legally or technically do with a commercial textbook. Yeah. And there are all sorts of other things too. There's an instructor solution manual. I'll actually show you a little bit later some examples of that. There's a, there are PowerPoint slides. So that's an example of an open textbook. And lots of other things, by the way, are on the web are, are open as well, like um, TED Talks are open. They are openly licensed. Do you see the symbol here? The symbols, it says Creative Commons. Um, if you look at the end of a TED Talk, you'll see this. And um, this one is by NCND, by NCND. So if you wanna use this in your course, you can. That's what the Creative Commons license says. You can copy it, you can share it with your students. The buy means you need to attribute the TED organization who owns the copyright. Uh, they're pretty good at attributing themselves here. Um, the NC means you can't, you shouldn't be making a profit off it, which for faculty, for us, it doesn't really mean too much. We don't usually sell it ourselves, make profits. And then the ND one, the last one, the equal sign, that just means that they don't want you to edit it. Can't change it. So you can't make a clip. You can't take minute three through five out of here and cut it and make a new video out of it. Okay? You could tell students to watch minute three through five, but you can't make a clip of that. It would be making a derivative work. Okay. Okay. So that's what that's what open textbooks are, and what open, more generally, things like this are called open educational resources. If it's not a textbook, an o, an OER, open educational resource. So, but open textbooks are are um, probably the most commonly adopted open resource. And um, what I want to do is just kind of address some common questions, some things that come up all the time about these, because they're a new idea kind of, and they're you know a different model. And so they naturally will come with some really good questions. So for instance, you know, where do I find them? Right. The best place to find them is at open.umn.edu, which is uh, where you will find a link to the Open Textbook Library. And the Open Textbook Library is the most, by far, most comprehensive catalog of open textbooks. There are, I think, over 760 textbooks there right now. Okay. And they're increasing just about every day. Um, and the other part about this is, I guess, you're, you, it's, it's made to be uh, as easy to use as possible. It's, these are textbooks that are collected from across the internet and put in one place in one index to make it as easy as possible for you to um, um, to, to find and then be able to use and send your students to. So. What about quality? Are they any good? Um, there is something in human nature wise um, that um, says for some reason if something is cheap or free that must not be as good right um so 
uh, take wines, for example, right? How many studies have there been that's saying that the cheap ones aren't necessarily any better or worse than the expensive ones? But um, if you price it high, it's assumed, oh, that's the better wine. The same thing I think is an assumption sometimes here with textbooks in that um, uh, because they're free, we question the quality probably more than we would question an expensive textbook's quality. One thing that we do in, in the Open Education Network, we, um, we collect reviews of textbooks from faculty like you and uh, post them in the library. This is a summary of the reviews that we have received to date about uh, the textbooks in the library. So they rate them from a one to a five. And uh, this is what they say. It surprises me a little bit that it's a skewed curve as much as it is, but um, it's really encouraging that people find some quality uh, in them. So again, going to quality, the other thing we can look at is research. And there is an increasing body of knowledge about um, looking at to be honest, what's, what should be the real measure of quality of, of these textbooks, which is how do our students do with them, right? What's their success? This is a study from the University of Georgia. It was a longitudinal study that looked at courses that changed from commercial textbooks to open textbooks or, or maybe open, other open educational resources over time. And so um, they, they compared the um, the same instructor, same course, using commercial versus uh, open. What they found was there was an increase of 8.6% in the grade, and the, cha the change in grade increased by 8.6%, and the change in the drop, fail, and withdrawal rate, um, it, it dropped, that rate dropped by 2.68%. And then you can see that that impact was especially high and especially if it was especially impactful for Pell eligible students, those who are most at risk um, financially, right? And, um, and so that, which kind of makes sense that it might impact them um, more than uh, the population at, at large. What about ancillaries? That's a not very common question. Um, this is an example of the ancillaries that are available to um, that physics book I showed you, that OpenStax physics book. Um, uh, they provide getting started guide, a solution guide, a concept trailers. These are videos about different concepts. Um, there are um, tutors available on how to succeed in, in physics, a guide about how to succeed in, in the physics class. Um, and so on. And um, you'll notice the little symbols here. This one has a little green arrow, a download arrow. This one has a lock. So some of these ancillaries are available and they're also um, like the, the student solution guide isn't available to every student. Um, it's available to you as an instructor. All you need to do is reach out to OpenStax and they will verify your instructor and they will give it to you. That's why the lock. Um, students, however, don't have like open access to it unless you provide it to them. Um, so there are lots of ancillary materials available. Um, and uh, OpenStax also has uh, partnerships with dozens of commercial uh, entities that um, might charge you 10, 20, 30 dollars for a quiz bank or uh, something. But so, so there's more available even than that. I picked the physics book as an example simply because I wanted to show you a textbook that does have a lot of ancillary materials. I want to also point out, though, there are books that don't have ancillary materials. This is just like commercial textbooks, right? Some have ancillary materials, some don't. So um, my message here is just don't assume they don't have ancillary materials and, and make sure you take a look to see if they do. Many of them do. Okay. Um, so I wanted, we've been talking a lot about financial impact, and that's inc increasingly important, especially during the COVID times here. Um, but there are other things that these open textbooks can do to improve st student success that you can leverage them for um, other barriers that hopefully we can overcome. And so I want to talk about these three, and I've kind of categorized them this way. You can customize the content, right? We said that the open licenses allow you to do that. You can contextualize the content. I'll talk to you about what that means. 
And there's also opportunities for innovative pedagogy. So let's dive into it. They kind of get, they kind of go from simplest to most complex. So I'm going to start with the simplest first, which is really just customizing the content. Um, I've used this example a lot, but I love it because it's the very first textbook at the University of Minnesota, the very first faculty member who adopted one. Um, she taught statistics uh, and she and her colleagues, three other colleagues, decided to jump from a commercial statistics textbook to this open one. And this open textbook uh, is collaborative statistics. It's created by Bar Barbara Lowski and Susan Dean. Uh, they are, uh, were community college uh, instructors in California. And they created this. It was a very, very, it's a very, very low level statistics book, which is exactly what these University of Minnesota faculty taught. Um, they adopted it. They used it for a year. They liked it, but it wasn't, they saw some of their students struggling. Specifically, they were struggling with making the leap between theory and practice. Okay, theory and practice. If you've taken a stats course, you know exactly what I mean. Um, there's a lot of theory, a lot of equations, a lot of like in stats, right? But then when it comes down to like, here's some data, figure out the standard deviation of that. Tr making that translation is hard and usually you need some technical tool to make that kind of the, the calculations easier. Um, they were using Excel in this class as the technical tool because it's a really low level. They're not going to use SPSS or R because though they're a little more complex, they're using Excel, which does really good basic statistics. So what they decided to do is to one summer, they took this book and they made a new book out of it. They created a book called Collaborative Statistics Using Spreadsheets. So what they did is they took all the concepts and they added the practice to it in each section and they um, they in included how to do this in Excel, how to find the standard, de standard deviation in Excel, how to so on. And then they added a whole bunch of like practice problems in uh, that were specific to Excel in the book to help them learn how to do this work in Excel. So what they're doing is just scaffolding the learning of these students and what they found were that the students who were struggling the most, the, who are at the most, at, uh, the most risk uh, benefited the most from this. Right? Anytime you make an intervention, it's those students who are kind of most at risk. The ones who are like, all it's going to take is one more bump in the road and they're out. They're done. They can't do it anymore. Um, what they found were fewer drops and more su student success in their class. So, so all they did is they edited the content, right? So this is just content customization to meet, better meet the needs of their students. Uh, really thoughtfully done. This is a sociology book, example number two. Um, from OpenStax, from Rice University. Um, this is the same sociology book that was created by BC Campus. Um, and when I say it was created by B BC Campus is part of the Ministry of Education or funded by the Ministry of Education in British Columbia, Canada. They, when they say they created it, they created it from the OpenStax book. They made a derivative work and you can see they call it a Canadian edition, right? And if you don't think about it too much, it might seem like, hmm, like really, is there gonna be that big of a difference between um, one created in Texas and one created in British Columbia? But if you start thinking about all of the things, um, I, I want you to imagine this first. Imagine you're a Canadian student in British Columbia and you're learning sociology from a textbook created in Houston. And think about sociology and the study of society specifically. The society in British Columbia is a little different than the society in Texas. Our government structures, our kind of cultural norms, language we use even, even simple things like spellings, measurement systems, like all of those things are all different, right? Our government systems are just assumptions about how the world works are shaped by a lot of those things. So imagine you're a student in British Columbia trying to learn from a US textbook that has all this context in it that doesn't fit your kind of world view or world experience and experience in the world, right? Imagine how connected to sociology you might feel as a student. Imagine how like confused you might be or how hard it might be to learn sociology when 
it doesn't seem to apply to your life in your world. So that's why British Columbia made this addition. They made it to apply to, to apply to the context of their students, right? So the idea is to bring these students along to help them feel like they belong in sociology. Sociology applies to them. And so, so this is a, a, what we're calling contextualization, right? They're, they're taking this content, using that open license to contextualize it. There, might, there are a number of reasons that they might contextualize it. One is the example we just gave, that it's just fitting the needs of this local students to change the context. This is a brand new book that we just learned about last week. Um, this is, they took this same, you know, like a, a anatomy and physiology book from OpenStax, from the one made at Rice University in Houston. And this, this is a text made at Oregon State University. And what they did is they edited the textbook. They made a whole bunch of edits. Um, a number of edits. I don't even know all of the things they did to it, but when they wrote to us um, about it, they said the most significant changes we've made have been an increase in inclusivity in the text. We've increased representation of people of color and different ages in the figures. So this is a different kind of contextualization, right? This isn't necessarily, a, you know, BC is, you know, Canada is different than the US. This is contextualizing to our country, to our students, that to say, um, you know, we want to make sure that everyone feels included here, that everyone feels they're, they're part of anatomy and physiology, and, and being sensitive to that and making sure that the context of our country is represented in the textbook. Right. Really interesting one. So um, this one, really briefly, um, is um, a project run by it was run by Kelsey Wiens, uh, who was a, a Canadian living in South Africa, who started a project with some astronomy professors there, um, and it was um, it was a project that um, stemmed from the fact that astronomy professors in Cape Town were frustrated with the textbooks that were out there for astronomy because most of them were made in the U.S or in Europe, in the Northern Hemisphere. So think about that context for a second. Think about being a student in Cape Town, taking astronomy and learning about the star charts and the star charts, um, the ones that may be emphasized in the books are the ones in the Northern Hemisphere. You may never see some of the stars in the Northern Hemisphere. You may never see the North Star. And so again, the idea is they wanted to create a textbook that applied to their students and the context of their students so that those students felt included and felt uh, represented and felt respected in the, in, the, in the content, right? Hopefully improving that in their success, okay? So that's the second one. That's the context contextualization. And the third one is opportunities for innovating in pedagogy. And a few quick examples here. Um, this is one made by um, David Wiley at, at Brigham Young University, um, who was previously at Brigham Young. He taught this class, Project Management for Instructional Designers, and this class um, is, um, didn't have a textbook. There was no textbook this, um, that fit the needs of this specific class. So what he did is the first term, uh, one term when he taught this, he had his students take an open textbook on project management and edit it and revise it to make a new one that's specific to project management for instructional designers. And so they did things like they, they uh, took out examples that may have had to do with sales and marketing or construction or whatever, and they put in examples of instructional design. Um, they created a bunch of assessment items and put those in. They recorded every, every term they improve on it, these student, the students taking the class. They'll go out and they, they recorded videos of instructional designers talking about their project management practices. They, uh, and, and they aligned it with national standards for project management. They did, they did all these things to it and they keep improving it. When they're all done, by the way, students will have um, authorship credit, right? I mean, they're, they've now become authors, which is pretty cool. It's, it's what we really aspire for our students to be able to create, to create new knowledge. That's exactly what they did. David, of course, served, the instructor served as the editor, kind of overseeing it all. 
Here's an example from uh, Rajiv Jangiani, who, who actually asked his students to create a test bank. Um, and he said that his small class of 35 students wrote 1,400 questions in 10 weeks, right? So that's what, about um, uh, maybe 40 questions per student. So, um, and what he has said is that he's convinced that actually writing a, 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 a question that by writing them, they've learned a lot more than by just taking the questions, answering the questions, because it 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 um, means they had to think about the concepts. It means they had to understand it well enough to actually understand what question is right, which questions are wrong, and so on. Okay. Um, and this is an example from Ravinder Rosa, um, and uh, a faculty member um, at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. And she's, she created this open anthology. She was frustrated with the um, anthologies. An anthology, by the way, is just a collection of literature. She had, she, was, uh, had, she had this class on early American literature, which was all out of copyright, right? Copyright had expired for this literature, but anthologies kind of are the, they, they take these publications and, and apply a lot of glue to hold it all together, right? They apply introductions, explaining the context of this writing and reflecting on comparing this writing to that writing, so on. So there's value add on top of these publications. And she was frustrated how expensive these anthologies were because the majority of the content wasn't even copyrighted. So she asked her students in the class to actually create their own anthology. So taking the content as early American literature and writing their own introductions and contextualizations and references and everything. And then she put it out there with an open license so that others can improve on it, which they have. So again, you end up with students at the end of the day who have published, who are authors, who have created new knowledge and, and um, um, created something new. This is a great quote from, from Robin, Dr. DeRosa. I will, I will not read it to you. I think what it reflects really well is just that open's not just about being free. It has the potential to impact the, what she says, the whole fabric of the course. Think about all of the different changes people have made to these books, the different ways that they have been able to improve on them. Uh, and think about the impact that that could have on any class. All right, last but not least, um, this is a, um, a website, openpedagogy.org, that um, uh, Rajiv Jangiani and Robin DeRosa created to collect open pedagogy um, examples. Open pedagogy being the term that we use for leveraging openly licensed materials and allowing students to contribute to them. Um, so there's this website if you're interested in finding more examples of open pedagogy. All right. So I'm going to kind of wrap up here by, by summarizing, um, you know, again, in this time of COVID, um, people are struggling even more to feel to be included in their education. Um, there, there are additional challenges to acquiring materials making sure those materials are accessible to everybody. Um, and so this is something that was created by our friends at BC campus um, that uh, just kind of reminding us that in COVID what the power of open education can have. It saves money, of course, and it structures time. Um, it's ideal for working at home, right? It's trying to get textbooks delivered to your house or whatever is a, it, there's a, an additional added burden not having access to the uh, like course reserves or the bookstore or that is an additional burden on students an additional barrier to their success um, anyway you can see the, the the opportunities here if you work together on something like editing a textbook you can fight isolation it's so an opportunity for people to actually work together so all right so uh, especially in these times, these resources can be really powerful. So the question is, what can we do? What can we do as faculty? And, and really, it's pretty simple. All I would really ask you to do is to primarily just take a look. Go to the Open Textbook Library. Um, we, we had the link up earlier. I think well, I might have it at the end of here as well. Um, there's an opportunity for you to potentially write a review. 
um, and uh, and adopt the book. If it if it uh, we'll talk about the review here in a minute. But after you've taken a look at it, at it, if you decide that you the adopt that the book makes sense for you and your students, then please think about adopting it. Consider using it. If it doesn't make sense for you or your students, then please don't adopt it. Right? I mean, do it makes sense, obviously. But but I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm really here just to kind of we're here to kind of give you some information about what is, and it's really up to you to make that kind of final, final judgment about what makes sense and what doesn't, right? For your course and your students. And then the last thing you can do is if you think this is a good idea, if you think that this could be a benefit to your program, your department, your college, your institution, um, raise awareness. Go back and talk. That's maybe one of the biggest impacts you can make is going back, talking to your colleagues. Um, these slides will be available for you to, to draw on if you want to, um, some of the statistics and data. Um, but you can have a really huge impact on, uh, on students just by communicating with your peers um, and, uh, and trusted colleagues, uh, people who trust your judgment. If you bring this up, it could really make a difference. Um, so here's the process for writing a review. Um, if your institution uh, is um, funding this, then what's going to happen is that um, they would provide a stipend for doing these two things, attending the workshop, which you just did, so you can check that off the list. And then the second thing is reviewing a textbook in the Open Textbook Library writing a short review of, uh, of, a, of a textbook. Right. So those two things. The process of writing a review is very simple. What will happen is um, you'll receive an email next week with a link to the, the online review form. It's a very simple form. It has 10, 10 kind of categories of things. You'll be asked to kind of rate each category and also write a short review, a short little blurb about each thing, right? And um, the review will be posted in the Open Textbook Library, and the review itself will have an open license. That's something you need to be aware of. Um, and if you're not comfortable with that, we can talk about that after the workshop. But it's it's really enough so that we can share that review with other of your others of your your other peers of yours, so that they get an idea of what you think of the book. And then after that, the stipend will be paid. So that's the process. It'll start with an email landing in your inbox uh, in the coming week, and and you write then writing a review by the deadline. Um, so I would just want to remind you, we're all in this together. We're all trying to do the best we can in this situation today. I know that you're extremely busy dealing with online courses and hybrid and remote courses and all of the things that are coming with this fall. Just remember that you know we're all in this together. This is one thing that you could do for your students and help them with their success. Um, there are people who are um, who are there for you, who um, answer your questions, um, and um, are happy to help you with uh, with adopting an open textbook if you choose to do so. So, thank you for your time, and um, have a great day. Now. Before you sign off, I do want to say a couple of things. 